managing to look after your plants in the summer weather. Even if you, as I do, plant plants that do well in your climate, we all get extreme weather events. And as you can see, I'm surrounded by plants that really look as if they were on their way out. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog. And I'm in South East England, where sometimes summers can average around 18 Celsius, 64 Fahrenheit. But this year, we've been hit by a record-breaking heat wave, where temperatures topped 40 Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit. And we've also had a very extended period of drought. And this is the result. So I went to the beautiful Board Hill Gardens in Sussex to talk to Head of Horticulture, Harry Baldwin, about what we can all do to save our plants when they're hit by these kind of weather extremes. Board Hill is a garden that's been listed as Grade 2 Star by English Heritage, and it has several collections of rare plants. It's also got outstanding borders, the most recently of which was designed by Chris Beardshaw and it's got a collection of champion trees and champion trees are trees that are the tallest or widest of their kind in the whole of the British Isles and it's got 80 of them. And Board Hill is open to the public from February to November so the garden has to look good every day. So although our gardens don't quite have that extent of rare plants and fantastic trees we do have mature trees and we have borders that we want to look after. I'll put links to Board Hill and to any other resources we mention in the description below. And if you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. So Harry, tell me what you have to do to the gardens to try and make sure that they don't completely collapse and how can we do this in our own gardens at oh, home? Um, it's just been relentless for that heat and I think it takes me back to probably re rethinking about the space that you're planting. Where is the space? What aspect is it? And also, what are you planting? So I think it's important to think about, is the right plant in the right place? Uh, if you're in a sunny spot, let's not maybe plant plants that do require more water uh, or perhaps more sunlight. Let's think about plants like iris, who have that thick rhizome that can store that water over the summer months and they can really thrive in that hot heat. So it's important, I think, to think about the right plant, again, right place. And if you've got it wrong, for example, I've got a couple of hydrangeas which I thought would be fine in this shady spot, but it's obviously much too dry for them and they are gasping, they cannot mm. survive. I've watered them, I've watered them, watered them, but they cannot survive. If I dig them up and replant them now, this is not a great time to replant anything, is it? No, no. I, I would just suggest just keep watering it every now and again keeping it alive and then when autumn comes look at removing that plant to perhaps a different place. Um, alternatively think about having a plant that will perhaps overshade the hydrangea that can deal with direct hot sunlight. Uh, so the hydrangea which generally comes from a sort of a, a low forest canopy which doesn't have direct sunlight. So I think sometimes it's good to think about where does that plant come from? Where does it inhabit? And let's try and mimic that in our garden. And you've got here some champion trees Taking that these trees are obviously also quite old, mm. if you've got a large old tree in your garden, do you have to take any special care of that if you have a sudden heat wave or prolonged drought? Well, I try to not really water mature trees because I think if they can't deal with, with that heat, perhaps, where they are and how old they are, I think it's just they've got to survive on their own. Is it best if your tree's gone brown on one side, for example, or one branch has died, is it best to start cutting it back in the middle of summer or should we wait until the autumn until we should be pruning it normally anyway? I, I would honestly just say if in doubt leave it. And there are a number of species, certainly deciduous species that can deal with, with, with heat from the summer where they brown their leaves. They've got sort of something called summer dormancy. So things like hickories for example can actually lose its leaves during the summer due to the heat um, but will quite happily regrow later in, the, later in the year again. So no, sometimes it's good just to, if in doubt, just leave it. So in fact, it's don't panic with mature trees. Am I right in thinking that if they're young trees, you've only had them in for two or three years, you should be giving, in a yeah. drought, they should have some extra water? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think generally, I say as a rule of thumb, three or four years of watering, and then they should be able to survive on their own. But of course, you know, here at Board Hill, where we've got trees that may be seven to 10 years old, we still have to water them because that 40 degree heat was just something we just never never expected. And what about shrubs? I have seen a few shrubs turn their tail up in the last few weeks and they are just sort of brown miserable lumps. So would a similar type of advice apply for that? Yeah I would say so. If you have a deciduous shrub uh, then yes it's probably stressed but I think if you continue to water it then it will come back. If it's an evergreen shrub 
then I'd perhaps be a bit more worried because they tend to, once they lose their leaves, really in a drought, like yew trees, for example, they don't really resprout um, and that can be a bit more of a problem. So, so evergreens, you do want to ensure that you are irrigating. Deciduous, you can actually probably get away with really having, having them drier than if, the, if needs be. Taking that we've all paying quite a lot for water now and also the water companies are quite keen that we don't use unnecessary water. At what point should we start irrigating those shrubs if we're worried about them? Well I think first of all it's important in the winter to have good preparation. So I think having a really good mulch under those shrubs is, is ideal because that's going to hold the moisture in for that shrub or for that tree. And same for the tree, for a big old yew tree that you have maybe in your garden, I'd probably suggest in having a big tree circle which uh, mirrors the canopy shape down on the floor and you've mulched that heavily with some organic matter and that tree is going to suck that organic matter in during the spring and it's going to hold that moisture and it's going to give the tree really a better chance for those, for those strong heat waves that we have in the summer. I would really rate having a tree circle just because it's so good for so many things. Yeah. If you're mowing up near a tree, you quite often clip the collar of the bark, which is never a good thing for trees. You see it in parks a lot, don't you? So having a circle prevents you having to touch the bark. It also prevents grass competition. Mm -hmm. So the grass isn't taking the moisture away from the tree. It's easy to irrigate as well. And also I think it looks smart. Yeah, no, it looks great. I must try one on some of my trees. I can tell you trees, now, if yeah. you planted another tree next to it without a tree circle, this would always do better. It's actually Brilliant. amazing how much growth they put on every year just from having that. And when it comes to the perennial border, I mean, certainly as individuals, we can't really hose our perennial border every day. We mostly don't have the time and also we may be under hose pipe bands or with metered water. Uh, but when I went and looked at my border, I realised there was a persicaria that was completely brown. I mean, every leaf was brown. I, I've just watered it and actually I can see green beginning to come back. So have I done the right thing? Oh, I think the good thing, like Persicaria for example, it has that sort of rhiz rhizome tuber-like roots. So it can deal with having some hot temperatures dying back down to the ground and it will come back again. But some things like say phlox for example, once, you know, once they die, they die. So I think it's important to think about the right plant, again, right plant and right place and keep mulching in the winter. Get some really thick mulch on your beds, which I think is ideal. And I also think having a good canopy layer in the border, don't cut down your trees. Use those trees as shade cover. So certainly deciduous trees that let light still into the border is great. But also it gives them a bit of protection as well. So I think good, good practices in the winter and also just making sure that you're making use of perhaps shade that you have in your garden. And people might think, oh, well, you know, things are going to get really tall and leggy, but that's not always the case. And if you are going to have a sunny border, then use perennials that can deal with that hot, dry heat, North American prairie style plants. This is a little bit different. Catalpas generally can deal with, with hot, dry summers. And this is quite interesting. Chris Beardshaw's put this into this design, uh, Catalpa purpurea, because it has purple foliage. And it's still purple now. And if you coppice it back, it gives you that purple foliage. And we haven't had to water this once yet. We're probably not going to cut this for maybe a good couple of years yet, wait for the framework to get there, get the vigour in the stem and the roots, yeah. and then we'll start to coppice it back. And so would that be taking it right down to the ground? I think it depends on what height you want. I think we're looking for something like this height. So we'll probably cut it back uh, probably somewhere about here, I would right. say, taking yeah. a good, good third to a half off, I would say. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's a great addition to a border. You wouldn't really think it was a shrub. It looks slightly yeah. perennial-like, but... Um, just a slightly different addition, really. Great. If we've got the border, we go out into the border, it, some bits are looking a bit brown and crispy, so we should irrigate them. One plant is looking as dead as a doornail. Should we just irrigate it and leave it and see if it comes back, or we do we have to take it out? I think I'll just continue irrigating it if I could. And if this, this really hot heat is just going to continue and continue and continue, I probably would look at, if you're going to lose a plant, I probably would take it out uh, and, and put it up nicely and just make sure you give it some care. So, I mean, a border is always one of those things where you're learning, aren't you, every mm. single year, what I should be staking, what I should be not even having in that in that border. So I think it's important to, to learn from the border. And if things need to be moved around, then move it. But I would suggest leaving it there unless you have to take it out. And there are quite a few azaleas and rhododendrons here as well. Am I right in thinking that in a hot, dry summer, you do have to irrigate those because they're making next spring's flowers? Is that right? Absolutely. So they're forming in the bud. So I think it's critical that they do have some summer moisture to be able to put enough, put enough moisture and nutrients away into their buds ready for next year. And the other thing I've read is that you shouldn't fertilise plants in the heat or in a drought because 
the fertiliser is going to make them want to grow and therefore you're putting them under more stress. So if you've got a sort of weekly seaweed fertilising regime with your plants, would you suggest that you sort of miss it out if it's getting really hot? Yeah, absolutely. My rule of thumb is generally don't feed to too much but generally I would give a really good mulch in the winter and in spring give them a good feed ready for the summer and then I might just do some gentle feeding later on in the year but generally I keep the feeding to the spring and to the autumn. I think yes. generally just just not too much because when you look back in the wild many of these plants just rely on, on leaf matter um, and really what we're doing in a garden is is so unnatural by feeding so much we don't we don't need to that much. So ha what is your recommendation on how we should water when we should water and so on. Yeah, I think it depends what you're watering. So for example, a small tree, it's important to target that water specifically for that small area. So you can use things now like called gator bags, which is a big bag that hugs the tree, it zips up, and you just fill it with water, and that will let the water drip out ever so slowly over a couple of days. So that water's gonna penetrate the soil profile. And I think that's really the same for a border. You wanna be doing it early in the morning or late in the evening if you can, and really targeting that plant, not spreading it across the lawn, which is just unnecessary, targeting those plants that really need the water, and not giving the plants that perhaps don't need it so much, but just focusing on the, on the correct plant, I would say. In terms of the plants that are typical in a border, can you mention some that probably could manage without watering? So generally things that have a nice big tuber or has a rhizome, anything like, uh, like say for example, Cocosmia, that has a corm which has all that moisture and nutrients stuck up in it, they can deal with longer droughts. I've noticed that my roses seem fine. Would you say roses need a lot of watering or are they fine? I think once roses have got their legs in the ground, they should be absolutely fine. So right now we don't water really our roses at all during the summer and they don't look like they're wilting. So once the roses have got their feet in the ground and they're ready to go after a couple of years, I would say ideally don't need to water roses. And of course watering roses then brings about a sea of other problems. You get black spot, you might get some pests and diseases as well. So I think ideally try and not water your roses and if you do, just water the roots, don't water the foliage. And lavender presumably also you wouldn't water either. I wouldn't, so, no, but yeah. saying that, our lavender was, was really on its knees actually after that 40 degree heat. So we did actually end up watering a bit of our lavender, believe it or not, but before I would never have thought so. No, oh, exactly. So really it's a question of just looking at the plants and thinking, oh, that one looks a bit wilty and yeah. needs, needs a bit of help. I mean, hydrangeas are famous, aren't they? They mm. go flop and then you, you water them and then they go, hello. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I think this summer, you know, all these summers perhaps to come, it's just one of those things we have to deal with um, without having to have too many remedies for. I think it's important in the spring not to overwater too much and don't feed too much so things get too leggy and therefore they'll rely uh, on the extra water. So I think if you start off plants with a bit of mean, I think you'll probably get more out of them throughout the summer. Yes, they might not put on as much growth, but you're teaching them to be able to deal with those dry conditions later in the year. There's quite a lot of fascinating history to this garden, isn't there? Mm. So if you'd just like to tell me a bit about that. Absolutely. I mean, this garden's completely steeped in history, which is fascinating. The nice thing is it's still in the family today, uh, but it started off by Colonel Stephen Clark, who purchased the property uh, in 1893. And the funny thing was, he was actually living just over the other side of Nardingly, waiting for the right property to come up. And he was waiting because he really wanted to find the right property with the right soil conditions. So on Board Hill, we're, we're on a large estate. We have a number of different growing conditions. We're on an east-west ridge with a north-facing slope and south-facing slope with a number of disused quarries. We've got seven different types of clay. We've got sandstone. We have a number of different growing conditions for many plants. And he sponsored many of the famous plant hunters like Ernest Wilson, uh, Reginald Farrer, Frank Kingdom Ward, and many others. And what's really exciting about the garden is the fact that he he catalogued all his correspondences. So all the letters that he received from, from Ernest Wilson in the depths of China, writing to the Colonel at the time, he stored it in the archive, and that archive still survives today. So we can take out a letter from Ernest Wilson from the depths of China and take it to a very tree um, that's been grown from seed back in, say, the 1890s, um, and you can see exactly where it's come from on the letter with the seed packet still attached. So it's got a really nice sort of connection between the archives and the living collections here at Board Hill. If you'd like to see some more tips from Fabulous Gardens, then I put our Beautiful Borders playlist at the end of this video. And let me know if you've had any particular problems with extreme weather conditions. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.